Um, I think the reading group here will be a less formal setup than an actual research talk. So please do feel free to interrupt me and ask any questions. Um, so I hope that this will be, instead of like a lecture style, will be like a more like a dis discussion style. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so if you haven't been living under the rock for the past 10 months, uh, you probably ha have heard about the uh, explosion of neural radiance field. So the task here is that you take multiple images of, the, of a static scene. Uh, either you take multiple images or take a short video. Um, and then you can build a model that can produce photorealistic novel views of the same scene. And you can see that the visual quality is quite amazing. Uh, I was blown away uh, when this come out. Like you can see that it, it, it can handle this kind of scene structure, refraction, highlights, uh, this view dependent effects remarkably well. Um, and these are very traditionally, it's very hard uh, to, to capture this level of photorealism. Um, so this is all great, uh, but when when I look at my uh, look into my cell phone, I found that I have never captured multi view images of a static things or uh, like video of a static things. Uh, instead, my videos look like this. Uh, these are all my kids; they are moving around. Uh, kids in the park, all right? So they are chasing around with each other. Cameras are moving, and kind of a lot of things moving in the scene, right? So people are moving. Um, they have the playing and something like a very highly dynamic things like uh, like water, playing water, and people in the background, like bicycles, all the things. So, I, because of this, I feel that it's uh, it, it will be great to be able to extend such capability of using this to this kind of videos in the wild. So that's something like like my my hope and. And interesting that that in the past few months that there have been very many new works on exactly this direction, trying to extend nerve uh, to handle uh, sync dynamics. So here I'm just showing a couple of papers that I I, I like uh, in particular. Uh, so here's one that uh, you you take a selfie video. Uh, you can see the capture process in A, and this is the input input views. That's what the input looks like. And because uh, humans are, are unable to stay perfectly still during the capture, so you will have to uh, extend the uh, neural radiance field to handle those dynamic things. And but the result is quite amazing. So you can see that the results, uh, view synthesis result in C and uh, and uh, the render depths in D. So you can see that pretty amazing results. Um, here's another one. Um, that I liked. So this is given an input video that capture like uh, like natural scene. You can fix freeze the time and perform view interpolation, or you can fix the fix the view, fix a particular viewpoint, and you can play back the video, uh, or you can do this two things at the same time. So this is like neural sync flow from Adobe and Cornell. Um, this is yet another paper that recently come out uh, from MPI and Facebook that you can see that the, it, on the left is the input video. And on the right is that you can see that the, it's a novel view uh, rendering of the same video. So you can see that the person is, is shaking the tree um, and you can see that it's uh, are smoothly interpolated between the camera viewpoints. Okay, so kind of, these are all great, uh, but there are many, many papers in this uh, in this area already, right? Since probably uh, uh, two months ago. Um, so in this talk, what I'm going to do is to uh, talk about neuron variant rendering, basically extension of uh, of radiance field for static things to deal with dynamic things. So here are these six papers here. Um, uh, but there are probably many more uh, that will come out in the in the in in the coming months or in a few years. So instead of like this is a reading group. So instead of talk, but instead of talking about each paper individually, which I think everyone would just fall asleep, I try to provide a unifying perspective of this work so that uh, and identify some of the design choices that evolve in these papers so that people can uh, better have a better understanding of what's going on in this field and what we should. Uh, care about uh, moving forward. And 
later on, we'll talk about, uh, we'll have a shameless self plug about our work in this domain as well, uh, which we leverage the video depth supervision. And then we'll talk about how we can um, like leverage the consistent video depths. Uh, we'll talk about the progress in this field um, uh, as a, my second topic. All right, so that's what I'm going to talk about. What I'm not going to talk about today is the method that, uh, that use multi-view capture. So here are some of the examples where people can use multi-view cameras set up and then they can do pretty amazing thing as well. Like for example, this uh, in back in uh, 15 years ago, this one in, uh, you, can, you can take multiple captures and produce something like a, that you can streamable. So it's also very amazing. And here's a re more recent one that takes unstructured video cameras uh, that, that can freeze time and then, uh, and then uh, render novel view viewpoints. Okay, so uh, if you are interested in more learning about this, this setup, you can uh, go uh, read up more of these papers. Okay, but um, uh, today I'm mainly focused on single video. How can we take single video and produce uh, dynamic view synthesis? All right, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Okay, so um, uh, questions, if not, then let me jump right in. So first, like, uh, I'm sure that many of people have, have like have learned this already, but let me just kind of uh, brush up your, uh, refresh your memory a little bit. So basically what, how NERV works. So basically NERV represent the 3D thing as a five dimensional continuous function. Uh, typically this is parameterized by a fully connected layer or, uh, or someone, some people call it MLP. Um, and that would takes in uh, uh, inputs as uh, like 3D location, X, Y, Z and 2D viewing directions as input. And then you will produce the color and density at that specific lo location and that, at that specific viewing direction. Okay, so this is an implicit function. Once you have this implicit function, we can render a scene at different viewpoints. Like you, you place a virtual camera, you can shoot a ray into the scene and collect those samples. Then you can use something, uh, some, some classical techniques in environment rendering to produce the, to render an image. Okay, and for each thing, you can optimize the, the that implicit function by trend by by using a, a collection of pose image. Basically, you collect multiple images, and with pose camera pose, and with that you can train this, this implicit function by minimizing the reconstruction error at original viewpoints. Okay, so that's kind of the like bird's eye view of what Nerve does, and if you look at this uh, kind of Zoom in this a little bit, you can see that uh, this implicit function, uh, this neural ra radiance field model looks like. So they have this XYZ location um, and viewing direction as input. And this is a particular structure they have. Um, here, the, the, the green box here shows the position encoding process. So basically they map the low dimension input to uh, a bunch of sinusoidal with different frequency. Um, and this help us to help us to interpolate at uh, like capture, learn high frequency components of the output. Okay, so this kind of the, this is the de uh, design. And if you look at this, you'll find that they are implicitly, this is a static, of course, that's kind of, there's no time involved. So uh, how do we deal, how do we change this so that we can um, enable dynamic things? Uh, what if friend, from friend to friend, the scene has changed, like the object is moving, um, new object entering the scene or, or something. Okay, so um, the first idea is that, okay, you just say, okay, we are not going to, uh, how can I enable this dynamic things? The option A is that it's very simple. You just somehow add the, the time information into this process. Uh, you add time as input. So your radiance field model will depend on time. And this is actually uh, three papers that does this, uh, that had added the time index into this process. Okay, so it's very straightforward. All right, so that's kind of camp A. And camp B uh, is to, to also stick with the static nerve uh, model 
but you learn a static, learn a deformation model. So the idea is the following. You train the static nerve in a canonical coordinate system. So it is X plan, Y plan, Z plan. And then for each frame, for each individual time, you, you know that it's going to deform somehow from the canonical space. So what they did is that you take a T and X, Y, Z as input. Then you would use uh, some deformation model uh, that we will talk about that later. Basically it's kind of, right now I can think about this is some black box that will produce, that will tell you what is the location of X, Y, Z in the current frame. Um, what that X, Y, Z will go in the can canonical frame. And you will use this X, Y plan, X plan, Y plan, Z plan as input to this MLP, to this canonical frame MLP. You get a color and a density. Then you do the run rendering in this frame. So that, that accounts for um, the dynamics in, the, uh, in, 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 your, in your video or, mod, uh, or sync with dynamics. Okay, so uh, the static nerve with uh, deformation, it's, I, I think it's better to illustrate this idea through some um, like older approach. So this has been the idea of using static template with deformation has been popular in non-rigid reconstruction as well. So here is a like famous example from dynamic fusion. So what you can see here is that what their their the setup is the you take an input depth map uh, depth video uh, as input, and then you when you capture this sequence, you also construct a dynamic model canonical frame. So this is static, and at new frame for each new frame, you 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 will then warp the dynamic um, the will warp the canonical uh, template to this new frame so that you match to the depth map as much as possible. So you can see that it's non-rigid uh, reconstruction, but they have an, an inherent 3D template uh, as, as a canonical that, that doesn't change with time. Okay. All right, so you can, you can see that how can they, this is this idea is not, Entirely new. This has been used in other domains where um, I, I think this is uh, other, other domain to handle the kind of. You can see that the, the, there's also parallax or, or um, some parallax going on, and but still you can see that you can actually uh, render many different uh, deformations by just using a static uh, static template. Right. So you can see that it's their deformation is quite large as well. All right, so then let me dive into the, how do we design that deformation model, that black box I was just referring to. So typically people use the deformation model, uh, a model parameterized that as, a, as an MLP. So, but how do we do uh, that? So what are the design choices? Um, so given an NLP, design choices are, Two, two things, right? Whether how, how are you going to use uh, the, as inputs and how are you going to use uh, as outputs? So if you say the input, uh, say if there are two different ways so that because MLP should be dependent on the time. So how should we make the MLP depend on time? The first approach is to do the implicit in explicit encoding uh, conditioning. So you basically take the time as input and typically people use a uh, position encoding of the time um, uh, frame index as input and you concatenate and this serve as input to the MLP. Right, another type of method that use latent vector conditioning that they, they, they attach uh, a, a latent vector, typically like low dimensional vector, like a dimension or 10 dimension vector for each frame. So here the WT is a low dimensional vector and that's, that is learnable, optimizable with respect to the entire network. So effectively you are learning for each frame, you're learning a latent vector that, uh, so that you will be different from, um, so that, you, so that it, the, the, the output MLP will be conditional on time. And this is not a, a, a kind of, this is not uh, entirely new as well. This has been used in 1995 
um, and recently has been used in deep uh, SDF and, and um, nerve in the wild uh, and so on. Okay. And so that's about uh, the input. How do we do about the output? So the output, basically you want to predict uh, the output, what the people do is that how do you parameterize the, the motion, right? From X1, X, Y, Z to X plan, Y plan, Z plan. And what people do, uh, again, uh, so two types of choices right now, um, but hopefully there will be more. Um, on the left, you see that is you can model this as like ask the MLP to predict some, some kind of translation, translation vector. Either you predict a discrete translation or continuous translation instantaneous motion. Um, but basically kind of predicting something like a, sim, like a synchro. Okay. Uh, on the right, you can see that another option is predict uh, rigid motion. So instead of modeling every location, modeling the X, Y, Z, DX, D, Y, D, Z, you can model this as a, a, a dense motion field. So for every location in the 3D space, you can ask it asks your network to predict uh, rotation and translation, right? And so kind of region motion. So, and the benefit of this is, is, is interesting because if you, you, if you try to rotate an object in 3D space for every location, uh, the, the X, Y, Z, the, the, the sync flow will be different, right? Because you have a rotation here. But if you predict the region motion, the, all the XYZ in the 3D space may share the same rotation parameter. So they, they say that it's diff, easier to learn in this way because of the parameterization you choose. All right, so uh, what can we do with these design choices? We can actually take these design choices and do something like a mix and match. I'm uh, sorry, this word is mix and match. Um, you can mix and match and then be able to synthesize all the methods that's, that we see today. Um, so uh, you, if you choose uh, whether you want to choose the latent vector or explicit conditionally, or whether you want to use a uh, dense motion field or the, uh, or the synchro type of approach, then you can uh, basically mix and match and then create uh, various different methods, what people have done. Okay, so this put in the uh, a clear perspective of how uh, different methods uh, change their, um, uh, choose their designs. All right. So hopefully this, this will help you when you read these papers uh, and or try to improve, further improve on this domain. Uh, this will help you to um, understand what, what's, the, what's the core differences. Okay. So but this is, this is a caveat here. If you want to use the deformation model, um, um. Um, hi, yep. Jabi. Can I ask a question? Um, yep. You gave a, a lot of uh, choices, and uh, is it at anything at the high level you can see the trade off of quality computation the wise? Um, yeah, um, I, I think the answer is I don't know because there's because all these papers are fairly new, um, I have there, and there's no um, quantitative or, or, or uh, comparisons uh, among these methods. Everyone is doing their own uh, benchmarking. So really we don't know um, what's their quality uh, or, or the trade-off um, uh, between among these methods. I will talk about a little bit about uh, a general dynamic versus the static with deformation, uh, this type of trade-off that I roughly understand, but like more detailed comparisons, um, um, this, this is still missing. Um, yeah. So hopefully that in the next year, we will start to see some more um, uh, comparisons, like put all these methods in the same uh, test bed, um, then that'll be, that'll be very cool. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, um, so these are the deformation model that basically predict some predict the you can think about predict the motion uh, from the the current frame to the canonical frame, but this you couldn't really um, just just predict this and then hope that uh, combine combine with the static inner hope that it will just do the rising. It will be, you will need some regularization. 
All right, so why we need regularization? So con consider this uh, hypothetical setup where you have Pikachu and side duck and frame one. And on frame two, Pikachu move forward and side duck move backwards. All right, so if you look at this, I mean, human can interpret this very well, but if you think about this, it's perfectly um, valid solution for translation, like you predict the translation, or it's actually that Pikachu actually have a level up so that it actually expands and, uh, and the side duck shrinking. So it's perfectly valid uh, option. So that um, these two types of motion, when you put them, uh, 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 if you predict them, that type of different types of motion, you will be able to minimize the trending uh, reconstruction loss perfectly. So these are equally good solution for the deformation model. So this is why we will need to use some form of regularization, right? So this is why we need the uh, deformation model. Um, and then in the next uh, three slides, I'll talk about uh, basically these are some of the choices that people make to regularize this uh, deformation model, okay? So this is about how. Okay, so if, if uh, so I'm, in order to uh, describe this, I'm reducing this uh, x, y, z, uh, and time to this 2D uh, pl pl plot. So on the left, you see that original um, for a particular frame, you have an x, y location, like x, x, p, y, p. And ba based on your deformation model, you'll predict something that's x, p, plan, and y, p, plan. That's the green dot here. So, uh, and I'm showing you here that you have a, a nearby region in the x, y, uh, x, p, y, p location, this rectangle will be mapped into some like deformation space, right? Every point will be mapped into this blob, okay? So how can we regularize these things? So think about this T is a nonlinear transformation between x, y. One, one way to, to address this is that T is a transformation from x, y to x prime, y prime. Okay, and so that you see that this, there's a mapping here, right? So at any location, you can you can approximate this mapping through a first order approximation. That's that is you compute the Jacobian of this one. Okay, so and once you compute the Jacobian, this basically tells you that how a small changes in the input will correspond to the output, uh, uh, to correspond to changes in the output. Okay. And then if you do the SVD on this Jacobian matrix, and what you'll find that it is that, uh, and what people do in, in the uh, specific, in this NERFI paper, is that you can regularize the Jacobian matrix such that the singular value should be as close to one as possible, which means that, uh, so that this is specifically this is their, their, their loss function, they, so you can think out if the single value is one uh, on a diagonal, then this will be minimized. Like log one is zero, then this will be minimized. If it's not one, then it will be, uh, you have some loss. What like a, 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 a too long didn't read version of this is that please don't have expanding and shrinking uh, transformation. So basically every transformation should just be translation or rotation. You don't want to have expanding or shrinking, okay? So that's, uh, that's an intuitive way of understanding what this uh, regularization is doing. Okay, this is a uh, approach one. Approach two is that instead of thinking, thinking about this as a transformation, you think about these are the, uh, think about from this, from this coordinate system for every location, you will see a motion vector, right? You can see a motion vector. So you can think about this as a flow uh, vector field, okay? So think about this as the, like a, you have some flow through dynamics, right? So it's a flow field. And with flow field, you can measure how, how well uh, the, uh, at every location, where, what's, the, what's the expected, uh, expects, expected inflow and versus outflow. And you, you can measure this by divergence. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, this should be a divergence. You can measure this by divergence 
and you want to make this uh, divergence equal to zero. All right, so this will this loss uh, divergence loss will be equal to zero when um, when this is uh, when the, uh, you, divergence will be equal to zero when uh, uh, this loss will be will be minimized. So I think one intuitive way of thinking about this is think about water. So water is incompressible. So and that water has the uh, this proper special property that divergence is zero. Okay. So uh, to, so basically, uh, in a nutshell, this is exactly the same as the first one. It's just different way of, of, of parameterizing this. Basically it says that you can throw, your, your motion can throw, but it, no expanding and shrinking. Okay, so that's the same, the same type of regularization as the first one. All right, so that now we talk about, the, let's talk about the third type of regularization is the, specific sync flow regularization. It's more a, a data-driven regularization. So how do we do this? So, and this is uh, from the neuron sync flow model from Cornell and Adobe. Uh, so imagine that you have two cameras. Um, you have two cameras. And on the left, you see the, a, a, a green dots uh, in 2D and you, you project, you shoot a ray into space and one of the sam 3D samples you predict the, the the motion of this guy, right? You predict motion, and that moves to the green, uh, uh, blue spot that is it's in time t plus one, and then you can project you because you know the camera position, camera pose of the t plus one camera, then you can project this back to form find another point. Okay, and now at the same time you have the optical flow. You can use uh, some off the shell optical flow estimation. To to uh, to estimate optical flow, so this if you you can constrain this T transformation, what this T transformation should do, such that you minimize the such that it matches the optical flow. Okay, so this is third type of regularization that use um, that data driven uh, approach. Okay. Um, and in addition to that, you can also uh, regularize this transformation so that like you sample these different locations so that it's spatially smooth, it's temporally smooth, it should be sparse so that like basically based on the assumption that most of the places are are static. Um, yeah, so these are the kind of the, the, the method that, that this paper use. So you can see how different methods they are, they are, they are how they approach this uh, deformation model regularization. Uh, I, I have a question here. Yep. So for, for this model, it seems like it also cannot distinguish between a pure scaling and translation towards the camera or away from the camera. Is that correct? Yeah, so optical flow, you can see that it will, it will have some ambiguity, right? It, all this sync flow will be, will be valid. But they also have some other regularization. For example, this should be smooth. This uh, spatially should be smooth. Uh, temporally should be smooth, and it should be like sparse. As spar and most of the sync flow should be zero, as zero as possible. Um, so yeah. So I think you're right that that regularizing the sync flow will be kind of will be challenging. So you will have to uh, be careful about this. And Oliver is uh, online, so you can. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver can 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 jump in. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a good point. Actually, uh, you know, the biggest ambiguity you have with these um, these single view uh, reconstruction methods, uh, monocular reconstruction methods, is this uh, is that the object could be very far away and big, or it could be close and small, and um, and the optical flow doesn't really help regularize that. We use a um, single image depth prediction network to help a little bit with that, so we can start like kind of at a reasonable depth range. Um, and also some of these sort of low level smoothest terms like spatial smoothest tend to help prevent the object from getting really far away from the camera and being really big because then it has to move very fast in order to match the observations. So like we found that if you combine the flow, the depth, and then these kind of low level terms, it tends to converge somewhere in a reasonable range. Yep. I see, I see. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thanks for saving me, Oliver. <laughs> no problem. Thanks for presenting this. This is a, a very interesting to see. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, and um, kind of summarize what uh, this is a high level summarization of uh, 
of what Ching's uh, question. Like you have these two camps of method, right? One is dynamic nerve that directly takes uh, time into consideration. Um, and it's the, the good, good thing about this is they're very flexible. You can handle like, because you essentially directly model the, the neural radiance field in a dynamic way. So that you can handle that topological changes. If I move, like change uh, expression, I can remove my jacket. It's no, there's no problem with that. Uh, but you will have difficulty, may, may have difficulty in terms of maintaining the temporal consistency. So you have to uh, regularize this in some uh, various ways. So that's kind of the minus point. And also you will need to regular, uh, so these are regularization on the radiance field itself. On the second camp of methods that you have static nerve uh, with deformation, uh, the, the downside is downside of that is that it's not particularly flexible. So for example, you assume a single 3D template, but it, if your application is like, okay, I, I really want to capture uh, something. Um, uh, I, I, I just want to capture something uh, frozen in time. Then this is the perfect method, right? You, you, you are learning only a static template uh, nerve and you, you use the deformation to account for dynamics in the video. Um, so it's easier to get a temporal consistent appearance. Uh, and the regularization is on deformation field like uh, we talked about earlier. And I think that the neuron symbol is one of the methods that, that sits in between this type of method, okay? This, 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 uh, this spectrum of methods. Okay, so with that kind of overview, I want to talk, kind of have some shameless plug about our method. Um, neural, uh, like free view uh, space time, uh, neural radiance field for uh, free view point video. So our idea is that we can, if we are able to constrain the time varying geometry, we can reduce all kinds of ambiguity. So we don't need to define a lot of regularization losses that may or may not be true for many videos. As, as long as we know where the uh, surface of the video lies in, okay? So um, this is the idea. So given an input video, so here's a boy enjoying a uh, fried chicken. And if you know the depths, uh, I will talk about how do we get a depth later. But if you know the depths, you can render this the same video uh, with, uh, with a different camera trajectory. And you can see that, so this is the mesh that we construct per frame using the depth map. So you can see that across the depth boundary, you, you will not be able to see, you have these white pixels. Those are the pixels that are not visible in the, in the original video. So of course you can say, okay, so now you have missing data. So how about use impending? But impending is still hard because uh, kind of this, this boundary is not, um, it, it's, it sits on the object boundary. So it's particularly hard to impend uh, using state uh, video completion algorithm. Um, as we said earlier, if you just use the nerve plus time, it doesn't work because you have many, many possibility of the scene configuration that you learn that will match your training data exactly. So you don't know which one is the best one. All right, so our idea is to use video depths as a, as a constraint to constrain the time varying geometry. And with that, you can, uh, you, you can alleviate this kind of ambiguity, All right? So you can see here, here's the results. All right, so the core idea is that you, uh, without depth loss, there's kind of infinite number of configuration that will match to the input video. With depth constraint, you can you can uh, disambiguate this time variant. You, you will know that whether the appearance changes is due to geometry or due to appearance. So you constrain, you fix one, and then you'll be able to learn the other one. So similar to if I tell you a plus uh, a plus b equal to five, if I tell you a, then you will figure out what b is. So the way specific way we do this is that you 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 know you can estimate the same depths uh, video depths and then once you, once you have this you can constrain that the expected uh, uh, depths from the neural radiance field should match to the same depths and also all these points before hitting the same surface should be should have zero density. 
Okay, so that's how we can uh, regularize the, the 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 dynamic nerve. And with that, you can also you also also have a static loss because it says that whatever we are not visible in the video frame, we assume that they are static, so that we can propagate content across time. So here is an example. Here is the input view. You can see that input views at that time is zoom in to this boy, but it, what if you want to render this particular time at the, uh, at, the, at the camera location that's further away, further back? So you can see that without static loss, it doesn't know how to interplay this location, right? Because you never see that locate that the appearance of that location is not visible in the input input view. So if you use static loss, you can transfer um, this content, this appearance from other frames but the transfer is leaves in 3D. So this is kind of one, one way to, to address this. All right, so with, we only have these two, two things, uh, plus the reconstruction loss, of course, but it's, uh, it's much simpler than, than, than you have to do various uh, uh, regularization. So here are some videos uh, from demo video I want to show here. kind of factorize this uh, ambiguity. Uh, as you can see that the results not perfect yet, uh, but uh, so we are still have a lot of uh, things to do, uh, but I think it's a promising uh, promising direction. The question I, I leave out uh, in the discussion is that how do we get consistent video depths? Because I think this is a really, the be able to constrain the same um, depths, like it's, it's really a, 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 a kind of a great way to, to enable free view video um, to, to, to deal with very uh, dynamic videos and video in the wild. So how do we get this? How, how will computer vision be able to solve this kind of fundamental problem? So uh, SLAM and Structure for Motion algorithm, uh, they only provide depths at very sparse points. Um, and even dense multi view stereo has many holes. Uh, typically when the objects are moving, like hands here or non-texture areas. And recognition-based method or learning-based method, they provide fully dense depths, no holes, but they flicker. And our method in, in SIGGRAPH uh, last year produced a detailed and flicker-free depths. So these are the depths we use for the, the video we, we showed earlier. And our depth is geometrically consistent. So you can insert artificial objects inside the, the scene and remove them correctly. It can insert a thousand bows. Okay, so how does this work? Uh, let's take a look at two images to keep it simple. Uh, we use an existing algorithm, uh, existing network to estimate depths independently for both frame. Okay. Then uh, if you look at the match point, you can get the match point from article flow. You can see and uh, you can see that depth is not consistent. Uh, assuming for a moment that we know the camera pose, uh, you can estimate this from structural promotion algorithm. Uh, you can project this uh, point via the depth onto the 3D wall coordinate. 
you will see that the two points do not end up at the same location. So we know the depth is wrong. The, the core idea in this paper is that we can take this arrow and use this arrow to propagate to the network so that you can train a network that can minimize this uh, error. But directly minimizing 3D arrow is tricky because uh, you can imagine that you can, uh, the network could potentially shrink everything, the entire thing onto a, a single point that will minimize the error. So, so it has this bias. So to prevent, to prevent this degenerate solution, we decompose this arrow into a spatial term and a disparity term. So that this does not have this bias toward a small thing solution. And once we have this, we can uh, resolve this. <coughs> you can train the network to make this consistent. And you can extend this to the entire video by uh, using, um, by sampling many random pairs uh, and solve for article flow. And you can backpropagate this and get this consistent depth, right? So uh, here I'm showing uh, a fun demo video of this. With these steps, you can produce a uh, very cool visual effects. Yes, and this work is uh, done by the amazing intern, uh, Shen, and in collaboration with Kevin, Rick, and Johannes. So uh, in the last piece, I want to talk about like some, some hidden secret about all this uh, neural latency field and video depth estimation here. That is that, how do we get a camera pose? Um, so if you look at all these videos I showed earlier, like it's almost static, it's the camera is slightly moving uh, in this case uh, and here as well. The camera doesn't have a large translation and it's highly dynamic things. And in fact, if you run, uh, if you kind of take the, all these kind of family videos and run kind of state VR structure for motion algorithm, that people always assume that it's, it will work. But in our experience that it doesn't work like 60% of the time. Only 40% you can extract the pose. So how do we get a camera pose to start with our kind of neural radiance field, our three viewpoint videos? So let's first look at uh, kind of revisit the formulation of consistent video depths that we, we, we just saw earlier. The objective here is to optimize the reprojection loss, some, some form of reprojection loss for every pixel P for every frame pair. Right, a sample from the from the back, subject to some known uh, camera parameters. Right, these camera parameters are kind of pre-estimated by some structure for motion algorithm. Uh, for example, uh, so here, for example, if you if we have frame i and frame j, given a two D point uh, in frame i, we can project this two D point onto the three D wall coordinate and reproject this point onto the coordinate, express this 2D point in the coordinate system of frame J, okay? At the same time, you have the corresponding point through optical flow in, in frame J. And you have the depth estimated here. So this is the loss that, that uh, you want to minimize, okay? But this is, uh, but if you look at this formulation, it's subject to the camera uh, uh, trans transformation. So we assume that this is done, but in reality, 
it's still a very hard problem. Like as I said earlier, like 60% of the time, it doesn't really work. It doesn't produce anything. So our idea is to just take this the same formulation, but reverse the role of camera uh, uh, parameters and depth estimate uh, parameters. So you, you are trying to opt optimize the camera poses using these constraints. All right, so the, this is a kind of toy example. You have three frames and X1, X2, X3 are the corresponding points um, in 2D. And suppose, let's say we, we, have, the we have the depths. And initialization, you put every camera is in the wall coordinate and you have certain losses and you can maximize, optimize these losses. <coughs> you can optimize the camera uh, parameters so that it's, it's, it's minimize the reprojection loss. Okay, and that's how you can estimate the, the, the poses. And this is a simple problem because this resembles the bundle adjustment, but here is simpler because you don't need to estimate the depths. But the problem is that how do you get the depths uh, at the first place? Um, you don't, so you have to guess first. Uh, our guess is that you can start with something like a MIDAS2, that's a state of the art single frame depth estimator. And if you look at this uh, bear uh, initialization, this is the projected mesh looks like this. You can see that on the left hand side, this camera is sits at the origin. If you use the estimate depths to, to optimize the pose, here's what you'll find, right? So you see that the pose is not very smooth, not actually correct. And the three points are kind of jittering a lot because per friend estimated depths is flickering. So that the arrow will propagate to the post estimation. So the idea is that you can, uh, the, this is because the estimate that is up to an unknown scale. So we can uh, alleviate this problem by estimating a per frame scaling together with the pose. So the result is more stable with per frame scaling. Uh, with this without per frame scaling, this is with per frame scaling. So you can see that it becomes more stable, okay? But still it's not enough. This global scaling is not able to compensate the temporal flickering. So to address this, we uh, introduce local scaling, okay? So with local scaling, you get able to cap capture um, more smooth camera trajectory and be able to stabilize the depths, okay? Uh, so we also use some course to find estimation to avoid bad initialization. So start from global scale and gradually split uh, so that you can have special, especially varying deformation field. All right, so together with this, uh, with some uh, additional steps, you can, we can get pretty good depths uh, on a wide variety of challenging videos. So on the left, you see this, this top lab, you see the input video and the estimate tabs. Here you'll see the, uh, uh, this, this videos from a third person viewpoint. Uh, you see the comparison from CoMap, uh, CVD, and the depths deep V2D. So I'm playing the video, so this will be fun. Uh, round this out very long sequence. Um, let me show you the long sequence results.
particularly exciting is that it's very robust. So it's it can uh, so to demonstrate its robustness, we tried the uh, Davis videos. No one really ex be able to extract Davis videos, the poses from Davis video, because most of the videos consist of many rotation rotating cameras. Uh, and here we can show that it's very robust to to extract poses and depths uh, from this wide variety of videos. So unlike existing method, they will uh, it will only work in certain conditions. This will be able to like open up uh, several new uh, possibility for this video in the wild. I, I have a quick question, um, if I may. Uh, have you considered using um, a SLAM system like ARKit and would that perhaps, uh, you know, kind of eliminate the need for estimating depth if you had uh, a system that you could, you could kind of trust the, uh, the poses of? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, the, you mean trying to get uh, something that you can uh, evaluate quantitatively? Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, so basically, yeah, having like a, like, so for example, when you're capturing your videos, um, a system like ARKit or AR Core on a mobile phone uh, would be able to provide you a pose estimate um, in some sort of a global coordinate system, you know, an XYZ and rotation um, yeah. to the camera at every single frame. Uh, and I guess I'm wondering whether, now obviously that, that has its own errors. It's using a different, uh, you know, completely different uh, technique for estimating those poses. If you fed those poses into this algorithm, uh, would you know what would the results look like? How good would they be? Sorry. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, we we didn't try the using uh, uh, like other poses. So this is the extract poses, and the evaluation we done in the paper is on synthetic data set where we have ground truth poses uh, and ground truth steps. Mm. Um, uh, we specifically use a Singtel that we have lots of motion. And um, so that's how we can evaluate this. Uh, it's really hard to evaluate this in the videos in the wild because it's very hard to get ground truth poses and ground truth steps. Um, yeah, I think ARP could be a, a way to capture, at least capture the poses like sufficiently accurate so that we can have a reference to compare to. Mm. Um, yeah, so that, that that's certainly a, a, a direction that we, we will probably look into. Cool. Thanks. All right. Hey, so, um, oh, sorry. Sorry, I have a quick question as well, John. Sorry. Um, what how, is it? Midas depth um, up to an unknown shift and scale. I'm curious why you're not also solving for this shift, and why we don't see points that are at zero depth, like right next to the camera in these visualizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Um, so, that's right. We did try to uh, align the depth map with uh, scale and shift, like basically additional shift, but we, we didn't make it to work um, somehow. Uh, so I don't know. It's just, uh, it's right now we only are able to make it work by scaling. So all this special deformation are only on scale. Um, yeah, probably because there's too much freedom if you have a scale and shift. Um, yeah. Can I have another question? Um, yep. uh, first, yeah, very challenging field, very nice work. So um, I'm really kind of uh, impressed and I really also try to catch up. Uh, one is, one small question is about the cold map or this estimation. Mm -hmm. Is it because um, at the era, is it because uh, you include the dynamic into the mapping? Uh, if able to exclude only identify the static part, is it? The post yeah, estimation yeah. will get better. We we uh, if uh, so for example, forty percent of success rate of Comac is uh, is after you extract, remove the uh, remove the dynamic objects. So we I mean that the way we remove the dynamic object is a bit ad hoc. We basically run mass CNN and then remove like collect the mask that correspond to dynamic objects like car, people, animals, and and uh, we use the same mask for for the co map. Uh, so, but even after that, it's still uh, for for those. Um, uh, for example, for David sequence, most of the motion, a lot of motions correspond to rotation. So, really, there's no motion parallax for for structure from motion algorithm to triangulate. So, so that's make it. That's why it makes it hard to to do that. I see. Yeah, my another one is really kind of just the open thing is like uh, when I saw is like a depth estimation optical flow, then uh, 
or uh, and pose estimation or this kind of thing it seems in a way and also uh, nerve itself is shooting through 3d array and do the reconstruction i would just wonder if there is like a kind of a joint paradigm uh, yeah plus also uh, uh, motion mm -hmm. in a way it's the deformal field but you know the background is not changing yep. that. Um, so I, I was just wondering, is it a kind of a little bit kind of holistic way of combining them together? Uh, sort of uh, doing doing that? It's just any thoughts or, or it's just uh, just yeah. uh, just observations. <laughs> yeah, 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 certainly. I mean, this is a I, I think this is a fairly young field. Uh, mm. I mean, probably uh, I mean, probably only three months old, right at this point. <laughs> So, uh, but I think that definitely it's, it's still a lot of uh, uh, like ideas, like some of the ideas uh, that we talk about, they, they could be mixed mix and match together, right? So, um, yeah, so, so I, I think be able to solve this joint is definitely the, the, the holy grail here. So I, I hope that uh, in, in very soon that we will be able to see something like a, uh, very uh, dynamic, highly dynamic scenes, and with this in the wild video, and we are able, able to kind of walk into the scene with 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 kind of using this capability from Nerve. Um, um, yeah, so th that's certainly kind of uh, something that I think probably a lot of groups are currently working on uh, right now. So hopefully, we'll see <coughs> a lot of progress in this field. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Great. So, um, so in summary, basically, uh, today, basically, I talk about two main things. Uh, specifically, talk about an overview of how how we can use Nerve for extending Nerve to for for dynamic things. Specifically, we talk about the design choices for how do they design the radiance model, deformation model, and what kind of regularization they use. And you can actually kind of with this design choice in mind, you can mix and match to kind of synthesize many different approaches and maybe new approaches in the future. Um, and specifically in our take on this field, we, we, we think that regularizing the surface will be, a, will be a key to kind of, will simplify the approach a lot. So specifically we, we work on, on condition, uh, consistent video depths so that we can, um, uh, and we also talk, tackle the, the problem of estimating poses uh, together with the depths. Um, so hopefully that this will become a kind of a tool for 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 handling a, a variety of video dynamic video contents. All right, so that's all for me, and I'll be happy to answer any questions or like any comments. Yeah, I, I have one more. Um, yeah, quite, kind of just general question about the field in general and how you see it progressing. Um, this is you know really amazing work, and uh, I, I I wonder what your thoughts are on. Um, you know, where, where, the, where the future is heading in terms of being able to, uh, you know, synthesize novel views uh, more or less in, I want to say, I want to use the word real time. What I mean is, um, you know, right now you, you essentially need to, you know, optimize for all the frames that you've captured. So for any given time T, you know, you're, you're incorporating information from subsequent frames. Do you think that there's a path forward for doing something similar, uh, but on some sort of a you know pre-trained network that can then synthesize novel views from essentially like novel image inputs, you know, with perhaps prior T's, but not not knowing what's going to happen in a future frame. So, so for for a concrete example, um, if you're spectating like a live event, so you know, imagine like a um, a soccer game or something, and you want to be able to uh, allow someone to kind of you know move move their head around in a video. Um, with, you know, within some some radius, uh, but of course you don't actually, you know, you want to be able to do this on either a live stream, uh, be able to perform inference without having to train um, every single time you have a new sequence of frames. Um, do you think that's going to be something, is, is that an area of active research or something that, that you know, this can be generalized to? Right, yeah, uh, yeah. So that, that is a fairly uh, kind of, I think, I think that we can discuss in two aspects. One is at training time, like, Currently, all the methods require per per video training, uh, which is slow. Typically, a couple of days, even. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's something that we need to uh, kind of. There are methods that try to uh, speed this up already. Uh, so there are multiple uh, papers out out there. 
Um, so, but, but still, the gap is still large to, for example, per sync training. And the second is the inference. Even the inference is not fast. So also there are several papers that try to address this. And, and, that, that, and there's another, another, another point where you're talking about is the generalization, right? So currently mm -hmm. everything is per sync trend. So it's not, I think this is going to be a holy grail in this field that be able to have a pre-trained model and kind of every weight is fixed and given an input, you will, uh, similar to what, what SLAM was doing, but SLAM is sparse key points, but, but be able to uh, kind of construct the, the video content on the fly and process, processing things. And you can enable a uh, novel view capability um, uh, on the fly. And that will be, I think, I think we will get there, but I don't know what, what will be the master toward that, uh, that I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, we have time for maybe one or two other questions if anyone wants to jump in. Uh, do you have any updates on when the code for the robust uh, video depth <laughs> estimation might be made available? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, uh, you'll probably have to ask uh, Johannes that we also need to get through a lot of uh, like a uh, check legal stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, very, but, I'm very interested. I think it's a really, yeah, I think it's a really interesting approach. I've tried to, to re-implement it, but I haven't got it working as well yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, 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 we'll post on Twitter when, when it's ready. Great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hope that this will be kind of uh, maybe not this particular method, but but maybe like this will facilitate a lot of uh, new applications, especially kind of from the perspective of novel view synthesis of dynamic videos. I think kind of be able to have a reliable post estimation is really uh, one of the key. So I mean, I have one question. So yep. I'm just curious, like, have you guys tried to chain these two papers together? It seems like you can totally take a video in the wild and use a robust consistent video depth estimation to get the depth and camera poses, and then run the first paper on top of those information. Yeah, yeah, we could, uh, but we haven't. Um, so, so robust video depth estimation is still not, I mean, it's pretty good already, but it's still not there yet. Uh, and also cur our current video nerve approach doesn't have a, a, a very strong approach to handle arrows in the depths. So that kind of be able to handle, be be make make it more uh, arrow tolerant. That will also be a, a an interesting direction. So that we don't need to kind of either we want to make it super consistent, or we want to make the the method uh, be more tolerant to the arrows. Mm -hmm. So like uh, certainly certainly we couldn't make it perfect perfect right. So because this un underlying ambiguity in the video depths, but but. Uh, uh, for that we can we need to make it the method more robust as well but I, I think the combination of these two and maybe other uh, uh design choices that from other paper from five other papers could also be incorporated uh so yeah. that i we would we will probably see uh even more advances uh in this field okay i have uh, one question <laughs> Uh, so thank you for the talk. Uh, I have, I was wondering uh, most of the uh, videos you showed were having like good light or it was like short during the daylight. Is the depth estimation somehow affected by the low light or like during the night videos? Uh, I don't know. These are the videos. Uh, typically, I, I, I mean, most of the videos are in daylight probably because. Uh, uh, Probably it's because of biases, like because uh, at night kids go to sleep, so I don't take <laughs> much video. Uh, but uh, um, I actually didn't know whether the uh, the kind of per frame meta steps will be heavily affected by night time. Uh, I that I don't know. But I, I, if I want to make a guess, I think it won't change too much. Um, all right. All right. Yeah. It, it should still be 
reasonably well um, in terms of getting a decent death map to start with. Thank you very much. Great. Um, so right. if there are no more questions, um, thank you so much, Devin, for presenting. Um, and thank you for all the attendees um, for all the great questions. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you.